So today we have uh, Dr. Nina Vance. Um, she's a, an assistant professor in mechanical engineering and environmental engineering at UC Boulder. Her research is focused on applying engineering tools to better understand and minimize human exposure to environmental contaminants, especially nanoparticles um, or ultrafine aerosols emitted during the use of consumer products and other everyday activities. So before she joined CU Boulder, she was the associate director of the Virginia Tech Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology, and she was deputy director of the VT National Center for Earth and, Env and Environmental Nanotechnology Infrastructure. Uh, Nina received her PhD in civil and environmental engineering from Virginia Tech in 2012 for studying the release of nanomaterials from the use of everyday consumer products. Uh, she received her bachelor's and master's in environmental en engineering from the Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina. <laughs> I tried, okay. <laughs> All right, so thank you. Thank you for coming and uh, take it away. All right. Okay, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, so my name is Marina Vance, I go by Nina. And today I'm here to talk to you about indoor air quality and indoor chemistry a little bit, uh, using um, the home chem study as, as a good example of that. Um, so first I'd like to make the point that there is a present, a pressing need to study indoor quality and indoor chemistry. Uh, the reasons are varied. The first one is actually we spend 90% of our time indoors. Even here in Boulder, people might consider themselves outdoorsy, but they're, they're still spending about 90% of their time indoors. A lot of people ignore uh, the amount of time they spend at home because they tend to ignore the time, the fact that we spend a third of our lives sleeping. Um, so that happens at home. So the majority of the exposures, and if you think about the the volume of air that we inhale, uh, the majority of that happens actually in indoor environments, uh, primarily at home and then at work and in other you know, fun places of entertainment, commuting, etc. cetera. Um, another important point is that buildings are becoming more and more airtight. We're doing that for energy efficiency, which is a great thing. We're trying to save energy from heating um, and cooling and overall ventilation, um, and that can really help us uh, shield us from outdoor air pollution uh, as long as the system is well designed. But at the same time, with lower and lower air exchange rates in indoor environments, we end up trying and inadvertently uh, concentrating uh, indoor air pollutants of indoor sources, indoors where people are. Um, and finally, chemistry indoors is very likely uh, to be very different from the chemistry that takes place outdoors. The reasons for that are varied. Uh, the first one is, of course, we have different sources indoors and outdoors. Um, we also have different types and amounts of surfaces. Surfaces play a very key role in indoor quality and indoor chemistry uh, as opposed to outdoors. I mean, look around you and think about the surface area to volume ratio that we have in this room compared to outdoors. And finally, we have different oxidants driving the chemistry indoors versus outdoors. In the room where we are right now, there's um, zero penetration of, of solar radiation, right? But we do have cleaning products that might be driving the chemistry. So um, the point here is that the chemistry indoors is dynamic and complex, definitely multiphase. And there needs to be, it needs to be investigated both in controlled laboratory exp experiments and in sort of realistic field experiments. And today I'll present to you about a field experiment. But before I get to our experiment, I'd like to point out that there is a history of uh, collaborative campaigns, large campaigns of indoor uh, field studies. So we're not the only ones. We're standing in the shoulder of, of giants here. Um, so I'd like to mention the team study. It took place in the 80s. Uh, they uh, um, did personal exposures of uh, about 650 people in four different states in the US. They were looking at personal exposures to about 20 VOCs, um, both in air, drinking water, and exhaled breath. And then about uh, 15 years later, there's the REOPA study uh, that was looking at relationships indoor-outdoors. So they were look doing indoor-outdoor measurements of VOCs and PM 2.5. They looked at over 100 homes in three US states. And then finally, about 10 years after that, the office air study uh, went to 
uh, about 37 office buildings in eight European countries, and they also looked at indoor-outdoor relationships of volatile organic compounds. In this case, they were looking at PM2.5 composition and much more. So there have been this, you know, this, there's this history of looking at many, many homes. And that's sort of a, that's sort of the, the, the theme, the common theme in those three studies that I mentioned to you, right? Uh, many buildings, fewer species of interest, because of course we can't investigate everything everywhere. It's, it's just not possible. And their primary focus was both on the indoor sources of air pollution and the penetration of outdoor air pollutants. Right. The study I'm here to talk to you about today is a little bit different than that. Instead, we took one house and we tried to look at, to measure everything that we possibly could. So we were looking at many, many species of interest. Our focus was still on indoor sources and the penetration of outdoor pollution. But beyond that, we really tried to dig deeper into the reactions and the fundamental mechanisms of transformation in the indoor environment in the hopes that if we you know, probe into those mechanisms, we might be able to translate that knowledge from this one house to others. Um, so that's our study. It's called Home Chem. It stands for House Observations of Microbial and Environmental Chemistry. This was a month-long uh, field campaign that took place uh, last summer, so around June 2018. Uh, we had over 30 state-of-the-art instruments, over 20 faculty members, uh, five industrial and governmental partners that loaned us instrumentation and expertise. Um, we ended up with over 60 researchers on site. and. Um, yeah, at this point, I'd like to acknowledge my co-PI, uh, Delphine Farmer, professor in chemistry at Colorado State University, who many of you probably know. So at the bottom, you see all the logos of the participating universities. Um, it was a very interesting um, collaborative field campaign. Uh, it was really fun to be part of it. So because we only used one house for our field study, we because we only used one house for a field study, we had to choose this house very, very carefully. So we ended up choosing the U-Test house. So it's a test house located at the University of Texas at Austin in the research campus, a little bit far, far away from the main campus. Um, that's the house there at the bottom. Uh, this house was built as a research instrument over a decade ago. Uh, they've performed several studies in indoor quality and mostly uh, building energy efficiency kinds of, kind of, kinds of studies in this house. Uh, over the past decade. Um, the reason we chose it is because it's very well characterized. It's been used before many times. Um, it has three different um, heating and ventilation, uh, air conditioning systems. Um, we chose the system that feeds the air from above. And uh, it has a continuous outdoor air, air supply. So unlike most homes, the house was kept pressurized the entire time. So it gave us a little bit more, uh, better reproducibility. Uh, at about 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 uh, air changes per hour. And the house is very well monitored for all, uh, all sorts of different physical parameters. There are temperature probes in all the surfaces, uh, relative humidity in every single room. Uh, energy consumption is very well, well um, monitored as well. So you see the front of the house over there with some of our instruments trailers over on the right side over there. And this is the back of the house uh, with more instrument trailers on the back and then the other side. Um, here's a look of the house on the inside. It doesn't really look like your average home. We try to keep the furniture very Spartan because we didn't want the foam in mattresses and couches and things like that to play a role in chemistry. We were trying to measure many things. We had to simplify some things. Furniture was one of them. So what you see really is metal tables, metal chairs, sometimes a little bit of stuffing in older chairs. Um, a lot of temperature probes on all the surfaces of the house and uh, many instruments couldn't be housed on trailers because their inlets had to be very short, as short as possible. So they were placed at the center of the house as you can see over there and by the front window as you can see over here. So I'll share with you a little bit of the, the instrumentation that we used on home cam and I'll go through these of course very quickly using this nice photo from our open house day. Not everybody that was part of the studies in the photo, but everybody that was there that day um, made it to the photo. So we had measurements of aerosol physics um, ranging from one nanometer, to one nanometer to 20 microns. We also did a comparison with, uh, by testing some low cost monitors, see how they, how they fared, um, and a variety of instruments located at different locations on the house to get a, an idea of spatial variability throughout the house as well. In terms of aerosol chemistry, we had a variety of mass spectrometers from different universities, well, three of them. Um, 
In terms of VOCs, we had three chemical ionization mass spectrometers, the GC and the PCR TOF as well. Um, we also had measurements of oxidants and several trace gas compounds, which can play very important roles indoors. And then finally, because as I mentioned already, surfaces play a big role in the indoor environment, we had different teams come and perform either uh, swabs of different surfaces to bring back for offline analysis, um, or they brought their own surfaces, uh, like a piece of glass or some painted board, and then they you know, decorated some walls around the house and then brought those back for offline analysis. So both in terms of chemistry and in terms of the microbiome as well. We had a team from UC San Diego that came and swabbed the whole house, every single doorknob and surface and chair and everything in the beginning of the campaign and then at the very end of the campaign to see if the microbiome of the house changed throughout this month long occupation by, by our researchers. So in terms of the experimental design, we had three main categories of perturbations. So this is not just an observational field study. We were doing things in the house, right? So we tried to focus on activities that people perform in their everyday lives, try to be as representative as we possibly could. So we focused on cooking, cleaning, and then human occupancy and the use of personal care products because studies have shown in the past just by inhaling, exhaling, and just being in the room, um, our, our own presence is changing the chemistry of the indoor environment. Um, these experiments were performed in two different ways, what I like to call sequential um, experiments, uh, which are semi-independent perturbations, so we try to repeat the same activity over and over again, and in between those we're flushing the house with outdoor air to try to bring it back to the background levels, and then try to get as many replicates as we could from that particular activity. And then what I call layered experiments. So basically we had three volunteers arrive at the house in, in the start of the day, then they would cook breakfast, eat, wait a while, then they would mop the house with a pine scented cleaner, then they would cook lunch, and then hang out, work on data, and then they would clean again, cook dinner, et cetera. So by doing that, we were hoping that um, we could witness the interplay of these emissions throughout the day in a more realistic situation that better represents an everyday, uh, an average home. Um, except this one's much cleaner because nobody mops their house twice a day. <laughs> but, um, but that's sort of the idea. So I find it important to mention that HomeCam is a field experiment, but really it's a manipulative uh, environmental experiment because we were in between that idea of, you know, try to control the house as much as possible, sort of a chamber study, but it, it, it really at the end of the day is still a field study because we have so many things that we can't control. So sort of in, be in between there. Um, so this is what the month looked like for home chem. We had several days where, you know, instruments are being calibrated. We're just observing the house at background levels. That was also very important without any perturbations. Um, we had some activities that related just to human occupancy. People walk into the house, sit around for a while, and then leave. Um, uh, a lot of cleaning activities, both using um, uh, pine scented cleaners, a bleach style cleaner, uh, a, na a product that advertises to be all natural, and then finally uh, an experiment with ammonia and vinegar to watch, you know, to observe all those different chemical processes in the house. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some experiments that I'm actually showing you data for today. First one is a sequential ventilation experiment. We did nothing but open the house close the house, open the house, close the house, and then we're watching to see what effects the outdoor air has on the indoor, indoor environment. Um, the next one is the sequential stir fry experiment. So basically we would cook a stir fry and then wait a while, open the house, and do it again and again. Um, the layered experiment that I ex already explained to you before, we're gonna focus on the three meals that were cooked that day, not really, not so much the cleaning activities, um, so the meals were uh, sort of an English breakfast, the chili for lunch, or the stir fry for lunch, and then for dinner we had one day a lasagna and then the rest day was a, was a chili kind of meal. And then finally, our, our most fun experiment, we did um, twice, we cooked a full Thanksgiving meal. We were trying to replicate or to think about what would be a, an intensive 
cooking activity that's representative, at least of North America. But it's, it's an interesting scenario for indoor quality, indoor chemistry, because it's usually cold, so people are inside for most of the day, and they spend hours and hours cooking. The oven is on for several hours. So we thought it would be a very um, cooking intensive, or from an emission standpoint, uh, especially particulate matter. Um, and that's what some of the results show for, for sure. Um, so the data I'm going to show you comes from uh, an array of particle sizers. So we had an AirModus A11 measuring particles starting from one nanometer. Then we had two SMPSs measuring um, your size distributions. And then an aerosol particle sizer, aerodynamic particle sizer, going all the way up to 20 microns. So we, we try to have the, the entire um, range of what's considered particulate matter. Uh, we, I'm also going to show you some data from black and brown carbon um, indoor and outdoors. So we had two of those little micro eighth athelometers. Um, one was placed inside the house, one was placed outside. We had no inlets for uh, separation of any kind of sizing. Um, but we did use diffusion dryers for both instruments so that their, the data can be correct, can be um, compared directly. And these ethylometers measure uh, light absorption at five different wavelengths, ranging from 375 nanometers all the way to uh, 880 nanometers. Um, the locations of our instruments were actually inside the house. So the ethylometer was right next to the stove, and then you have the two, the A11 and the two SMPSs, and the APS was a little bit farther away. Um, so it's Important to note because we had a lot of instruments during home chem. Most of them were in the trailers, and the instrument, the trailer in inlets were actually on the other side of the kitchen, as you can see over there. They look closer in the picture, but they're maybe, I want to say, six, eight feet away from each other. Um, so I'm going to show you some preliminary results on aerosol physics uh, measurements throughout the campaign that mostly refer to these meals that were cooked throughout the month. So first of all, uh, here's some um, size segregated PM mass per meal cooked. So this, this, uh, these data were averaged from the moment the heat source was turned on to the moment the heat source was turned off. So it doesn't include the decay period or any background, of course. Um, and the first thing we can tell here is that there's a clear difference between the toast and lasagna and then the other four meals. So breakfast was a higher um, emitter or that had the higher, highest concentrations of uh, mass concentrations of PM. And then you see the chili and then the two types of stir fry, either using gas or electric, were very, very similar. Um, and then all of these, you see a lot of pink and black, which is PM 2.5 to 10, and then PM 10 to 20. So a lot of uh, coarse mode par particles, whereas you don't observe them uh, with the toast and the lasagna. Uh, the lasagna was baked in the, baked in the oven. All other meals that I'm showing here were cooked with um, with an open pot. And there are studies that show before, sh that have shown before that uh, if you're using oil while cooking and you're stirring uh, the, you know, bubbles um, um, exploding in your pot, uh, with, there must be a better way to say that, um, will lead to the formation of coarse aerosol, of course. Um, so in terms of ultrafine, so this was on a mass basis, right? So let's focus now on the ultrafine uh, particulate matter because that would be uh, very interesting from a public health standpoint. So what you see here during stir fry cooking is um, on a number basis here on the left is a comparison between the gas uh, cooking. Uh, we had a propane stove at the house, which is unusual but still representative, and then a hot plate shown in blue. So an electric source, what you see is about seven, th seven times more particles on a number basis than the electric hot plate. So of course the, com the combustion of propane generated a large number of particles, all sub 10 nanometers in size. Um, and that's for um, just the heat source with no pan. And then what you see here on the left is during actual meal cooking. So it didn't change very much. You have a Fewer particles, slightly bigger, uh, but still definitely in the ultrafine range. Um, particles with on the hot plate we had the mode a little bit over 10 nanometers, but then the particles on the gas still had the mode below the point where we can actually measure or tell. Um, 
And that's on a number basis. So then if we looked at the same data on a mass basis, then you see on the, on the other side of the plot um, particles being formed, as I showed before, on the accumulation mode and the coarse modes. And then there isn't much difference, right, between the gas and the hot plate as a, as a heating source. So that tells us that while the heat source, in this case the, the gas, the propane burning, was the main source of ultrafine particles or particles on a number basis, the food itself really is the driver for uh, aerosol formation on a mass basis. Um, so if we look at the same meals, but in terms of black and brown carbon con concentrations, we see similar trends here. The highlighted in yellow are the three meals that I showed you before, breakfast, the chili, and the stir fry. Again, the breakfast had a little bit higher concentrations, but in terms of black carbon, uh, the median is, is higher than chili and stir fry, but there's still a little bit of overlap um, for breakfast. Um, what you see here also is a com comparison with a moment in which the house is unoccupied and there's nobody there. There's a period of no activity. We didn't really measure any brown carbon or calculate any brown carbon, just um, black carbon. The same is true for the ventilation day in which windows were, and doors were opened and we let outdoor air come in as much as possible. Uh, both of these concentrations for black carbon were much lower than uh, what we observed during the cooking events. And then if we look at Thanksgiving, <laughs> things are, are a little bit different. So as I mentioned before, it's a very intensive cooking, cooking experience. Um, these again are the average from the heat source on to heat source off. So throughout the day, um, black and brown carbon concentrations were very high during Thanksgiving, um, uh, significantly higher than any other meal cooked. And another thing that we observed that was interesting is that we see a flip between the black and the brown carbon concentrations. So for Thanksgiving, we had a lot of oven cooking and roasting, and we ended up seeing more brown carbon than black carbon throughout the day. So still using the black and brown carbon data, but now we're calling the brown carbon UVPM because we couldn't, can't really do um, calculate the angstrom coefficient to do to really calculate um, brown carbon when you're doing indoor and outdoor data. So we are calling black carbon black carbon and we're using absorption at 375 nanometers and we're calling that UVPM. So what you see here is a little histogram of the ratio between indoor concentrations and outdoor concentrations throughout the day. So what's the first thing we can tell is that the ratios were always, almost always below one, which means that concentrations outdoors were higher than indoors. This is for moments of no activity, so there's nothing going on in the house, either during the day or during the night, and that ratio ranges between 0.3 and 0.5. What's interesting is that the ratio was 0.3 for brown carbon, and for black carbon is a little bit higher. Um, and we're still trying to sort out that, but it might be that these aer aerosols just exist at different size ranges. So their penetration through the building envelope is different. Um, these levels, th this ratio of 0.3 to 0.5 is pretty uh, consistent with what, with what we see in the literature, that the building envelope filters basically half of the, the particulate matter as it, comes, as it comes inside. So this picture starts flipping a little bit once we start cooking, right? And here's data for those three meals that I've shown you before, breakfast, chili, and stir fry. Now the ratios are almost or about one between 0 0.8 and one between indoors and outdoors. But as I showed you before, um, if you only had air from outside, particulate matter from outside coming in, you would end up with a ratio of about 0.5. So by calculating the penetration through the building envelope, we estimate that of actual um, exposure to black carbon at least, um, cooking contributed about 58% of what we observed indoor and, uh, indoors, and the penetration from outdoors contributed uh, about 42% on average. And then during Thanksgiving, I had to plot it on a different chart because as you can see, the y-axis goes all the way up to 30. So there are moments where um, concentrations indoors were 29 times higher than what they were out outdoors. On average, we had for black carbon, uh, an indoor-outdoor ratio of three and for uh, UVPM of about seven. So again, uh, very high emissions of brown, brown carbon or um, organic aerosol in general, I believe. and um, leading to a very high ratio. So if we look at this Thanksgiving experiment, but a little bit more carefully throughout the day through a time series, what you see here is the 
Um, what you see here is the particulate matter mass segregated by size throughout the day, starting from the beginning of the day. Um, this area represents the periods in which the oven was on. The peak earlier on was breakfast. And then those one, two, three, four brown dots represent moments in which the oven was opened, and that coincided with a peak. That didn't happen every single time. The oven was opened many more times than that, but those were particular moments in which we opened the oven and then we ceased, we removed something from the oven and then made the source go effectively go away. So by looking at this, we can take a, we can actually assign acti specific activities to these peaks because we had a very detailed activity log. So we know that the first peak came from breakfast, and you can see not a whole lot of ultrafine aerosols were emitted during breakfast, as you know from before. A lot of it was accumulation mode and coarse. Um, then we cooked a toast, a piece of toast, and then we roasted the stuffing for for. Um, for Thanksgiving stuffing. And then you see very high emissions of ultrafine aerosols at the beginning when we're just browning bread. It makes a lot of sense. First, you, if you like making stuffing for your Thanksgiving, first you brown the bread, um, toast it up, dry it up, and then you see a little bit of charring on the bread, and that's your ultrafine aerosols. Later on, when we're baking the actual stuffing and it's wet and moist, the emissions weren't very high, and we didn't have a whole lot of ultrafine aerosols being emitted, which is the orange line at the bottom. Um, we r baked pies, and they led to some emissions as well, but nothing too interesting. The turkey itself didn't lead to an emission on PM mass basis that we could tell, but we could see the signature from the turkey on many other instruments, uh, lactic acid and other things um, on the gas face as well. Um, Brussels sprouts were actually the culprit for the highest moment of PM emissions throughout the day. And again, it makes a lot of sense, right? You're charring something in the oven. You want to make it nice and brown and crispy, and then you're making all those uh, ultrafine aerosols. In this case, ranging from ultrafine to PM 0.5, right? Not a whole lot of coarse aerosols. And then guests arrived. Guests arrived, and then they cleaned the house, blew out a candle, and that's when you see that separation for the very coarse PM10 and PM20, just from the dust resuspension from the, from the floor, shedding from our clothes and skin cells and things like that. So just occupant movement. Um, if we try to do a comparison with some ambient standards and guidelines to really understand what these data mean, um, we, we kind of have to use ambient standards because there are no standards or guidelines for indoor air quality, which is something that I find um, important. Um, so let's compare them with ambient standards. And what you see here is the 24-hour average for PM 2.5 in micrograms per cubic meter, missing the micron, um, for days in which we had a full day's worth of data, in which the house was basically closed and being used throughout the day, uh, those repeated experiments wouldn't really work for this because they're not very representative of a full day. Um, oops, sorry, wrong. There we go. So we would be below the US uh, ambient national air quality standards because again, it's a 24 hour average, right? And for a lot of the time that we're indoors, we're sleeping, we're not doing any activity. So once you average the, all of that out, we're below the, the ambient air quality standards of 35 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, but if you look at the World Health Organization guideline of 25, Thanksgiving Day did exceed that. And then if we go beyond that and we try to look at maybe the air quality index as, as a, a better metric, I don't know if it's better, but as a different metric, of what was going on. Of course, the air quality index uses a lot of different um, different air pollutants of choice to, to calculate the index. We're only looking here at PM 2.5. Uh, the air quality index would be good for most of those days, um, but it would be moderate for Thanksgiving Day, as you can see over there. Moderate, almost above moderate. But the main point here is that we're using 24-hour averages, right? But may, perhaps we should be looking at things a little bit differently when we're talking about indoor air pollution, exposure to indoor pollutants, uh, being so close to the source and having such acute peaks of emissions. It might be more, interested in, it might be more interesting to look at, um, at the entire day or on a, you know, on a shorter time, time scale than a 24-hour average. So during Thanksgiving Day, the air quality index would have ranged from good to, for a little bit of the time, to um, having about an hour of uh, hazardous air quality, according to the air quality index. Again, that's 
on a 24-hour average, so we're, we're making a stretch here. But it's something that really needs to be um, investigated and thought about in terms of comparing these ambient standards with indoor uh, realities. So because we have size segregated data and we can make some assumptions, we can calculate the particulate matter mass deposited in the respiratory system. So we use the ICRP lung deposition model for calculating those, uh, those depositions in terms of PM mass. Um, and what you see here is that about 14% of the particulate matter um, if, well, if somebody were outside throughout one of the days of home chem, only about 14% of the particulate matter that they inhale would end up in the alveolar system. But because indoors we're so much closer to the source and we had such high emissions of ultrafine aerosols, what you can see there is that on a Thanksgiving day, for example, about half of the particulate matter would deposit in the alveolar region. Um, on the layer day, which is the day where we had the breakfast, the stir fry, et cetera, uh, about 21% 20 of the uh, particulate matter would deposit in the alveolar region. And as you can see, overall uh, depositions are much higher on the layer day and the Thanksgiving day than an unoccupied building, of course, and then um, comparable, comparable concentrations for that time scale outside. So in summary, um, one thing that we thought was really interesting was we observed over 100 micrograms per cubic meter of PM.1 during Thanksgiving Day, which is something I didn't even think was possible. Um, and PM2.5 exceeded 10 micrograms per cubic meter for over 70% of the time. As mentioned before, uh, the stove and the oven were the main source of PM.1, so the combustion itself. Um, the food was the main source of particulate matter ranging from PM 2.5 to PM 10, and then occupant movements were also the source of um, very coarse particles over 10 micro micrometers in size. Uh, we observed that mainly black carbon was coming from outdoors, brown carbon from cooking, and Finally, of course, I have to say this is only one house, one experiment. Uh, we try to th do things as repeatedly as we, as re in a repeatable manner as much as possible. But uh, one house is not representative of a whole community or, or country. But it does allow us to investigate you know, the sources, the reactions, the sinks, and the mechanisms a little bit better in ways that we couldn't do in several, uh, several homes. And that leads us to the question, you know, what's better, large amounts of fewer measurements, um, investigating 100 homes, or high resolution data from, a few, from fewer locations? I think for, when it comes to indoor quality and indoor, indoor chemistry, we need both. We need studies like home chem, but then we also need large studies so that we can do these kinds of comparisons and benchmarking to really see how representative our values are. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, my um, team members, uh, my postdoc Samir Patel, and my P Ma now PhD student Sumit Sankian, who were both in my group and were there at home camp throughout the entire time. All the figures you saw, the data uh, that I presented came from their work. Um, as I mentioned before, I'd like to acknowledge my co-PI, Delphine Farmer, uh, the professor Tilanova Selak at the University of Texas, who was responsible for taking care of the, the test house and uh, welcoming us and, and providing a lot of support and additional measurements, and the entire team of home chem collaborators. Uh, this study was funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And finally, I would like to make a plug for our website, indoorchem.org. So if folks are interested in chemistry indoors, the website has a lot of resources. We have a blog and we have a page that has descriptions of every project that has been funded by this uh, program at Sloan. I think we have over a dozen projects described there. Um, we also have a Twitter account if you're on Twitter. If you're not, I recommend it. Um, Science on Twitter is getting is getting a lot of, um, is seeing a lot of growth lately. And there's been a lot of interesting conversations on Twitter, both between scientists and between scientists and the general public. But what I witness most is uh, people having side conversations at conferences uh, on Twitter, which is kind of enriching. Um, so I highly recommend it. With that, I'd like to thank you and take any questions you may have. I might have missed this, but um, 
did you were you measuring closest to the emission source that you could get or did you make some multiple yes. measurements thinking about if a person was cooking versus kind of at the kitchen table how much ultra fine they would be inhaling yeah that, that would have been great because our instruments are quite large and we didn't do we try to minimize inlets as much as possible because we wanted all the other instruments to be as close to the a11 uh, single nanometer aerosol instrument and that instrument you really can't have an inlet on that one um, we placed all of our inlets at the center of the kitchen as you can see over there so it's they're about four feet away from the stove so they're representative of an exposure scenario of somebody actively cooking present in the kitchen uh, there's a lot of work going on using the home chem data set to try to understand both modeling and by using other data to try to understand the the movement of air throughout the house and and the transport we're going to definitely use that knowledge for emissions modeling which we're doing next we had some uh, low cost monitors up on the top of the, the shelves and in the living room, but we also had an instrument from Handix that's an optical particle counter. Uh, the farmer group was operating that instrument and they're on those little cake pans at the top of the, the kitchen cabinet there and they were in every room. So um, there's a student from CSU working on the spatial distribution of aerosol throughout the house. So we didn't do any personal monitoring, that would have been awesome, but we, we didn't do it at the study. So I see you have um, an oven hood there. We do. Did you guys employ that? Did you do like tests with it on and off or was that not part of this program? We did not. So that's, there were things that we did to the ventilation system that were done in order to make this study as reproducible as possible. So this house had multiple things that were not representative of an of a average home. Uh, we had, as I mentioned, the, um, outdoor air supply bringing in 0 0.5 air changes per hour no matter it, it varies a little bit with outdoor conditions with wind uh, speeds especially so we had that forced air coming in which is not really representative but we also had an inside indoor uh, recirculation system so basically the AC system even though the AC itself the cooling coils weren't on all the time of course they just turned on and off to regulate the temperature the fan itself we left it on all the time because we didn't want that fan turning on and off to affect our measurements, right? And we wanted to try to uh, we wanted to try to homogenize the air in the house, which gets back to your point, as much as as quickly as possible. So that system was set to artificially recirculate the air inside within the house at eight air changes per hour. Um, the and then this is the third thing: we did not operate the hood. There are multiple reasons. One of them is I have not found census data that tells me actually the percentage of people who use them, uh, but there is data showing the percentage of hoods that work and, and don't work, and many of them don't really work very well. They just recirculate. So we didn't want the study to be affected by the particular effectiveness of this hood and the way that it operates. Oh, the other thing that we did in terms of the ventilation system is we had a very, very rough filter on the outdoor air supply just to protect the fan. And we had no additional filter. Most homes, if you have a mechanical ventilation system, you have a filter that you should be replacing every three or four months. We did not have one of those because we didn't want the filter loading effects and the chemistry on the filter to add another level of complexity to the study. Other questions? So did the breakfast have bacon in it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, the breakfast, the breakfast is over there. So we try to make an English breakfast. Everything we cooked had a reason. It wasn't just because we like to eat it. Um, but basically the reason was chemistry. So we ended up, Delphine and I ended up deciding on an English breakfast. So we cooked some tomatoes for the organic acid content. We definitely had some breakfast sausage because we wanted that caramelization, exactly the brown carbon and all that. And then we, we, we thought we had to have eggs. We didn't really have a chemistry reason for the eggs. Um, <laughs> the toast was needed. There are studies in the past showing emissions from toast. Everybody was interested. We're like, let's make toast. And it became a fun, quick, thing to do every once in a while to test instruments and to see if things are awake. It's like, let's make some toast. It was easy. In the coffee, uh, there are um, our colleagues from Berkeley, from the Goldstein group, they have done measurements in California uh, before and they had found uh, compounds, VOCs in the air from coffee brewing. So we decided to include the coffee for that reason. 
So that was, yeah, that's basically the breakfast. And no then, bacon, but yes, yeah. sausage. <laughs> yeah, but something with fat that is going to emit a lot of stuff. But then you mentioned at the beginning the personal care products, but um, do you have any, like, was that sampled in a different part of the house? And So for the personal care product experiments, I think this picture may help. So we had folks come in and they sat on those tables. Uh, we had what we called staggered occupancies, the name of the experiment that we came up with. Uh, we had people coming in pair to, in groups of two or three every half an hour. So we would see occupancy increase stepwise and then decrease in the same manner. So we could see if the concentrations of VOCs followed that, uh, SVOCs as well, maybe squalene oxidation products, um, things like that, lactic acid. Um, because I didn't perform those measurements, I'm not presenting any of these data. And folks are still, actually, this is one of the experiments where uh, folks are still working, working the data. I haven't seen a whole lot of preliminary data from that yet. Um, but it's interesting. We had three different uh, days of occupancy experiments. And we try to make, without really telling the volunteers what to do, we try to make sure that in one day they prioritize the use of all, what they consider to be all natural products. Another day, just have whatever they wear normally. And then the last day was go crazy. Pretend you're going to a party and you know put on whatever you want to so see if there would be any actual difference. But I don't have results to share you on that. Anybody else? So does someone live in this house now? Sorry? Does someone live in this house? Nobody's allowed to live in the house. Okay. Yes, it's it's a, a rule of the University of Texas that the house the house is a research instrument. Apparently, we've been talking to them about doing some overnight experiments, and you know, but as long as nobody moves in into it, it's it's okay. Apparently, cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.